and welcome to Business Connections. I'm Holly Allen, Director of Director of Marketing Communications for the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. That's who produces this show. It's a new year, a new start, and businesses throughout the Dayton region are looking, they're planning for 2016, hoping that they will have a successful year. We all wish we had a crystal ball. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have with me today Tom Trainer, who is an economics professor with Wright State University. Thank you for being with us today. Certainly. Put a little pressure on you. You have to uh, be our crystal ball today. At least you'll make some predictions for us. That's right. If you remember, you and I were here in this exact studio a year ago, mm -hmm. and we took a look back at 2014, and you made some predictions for 2015. So we'll see what, how those predictions turned out and how 2015 went. But I'm going to ask you to start out the same way you did last year and do a little retrospective. Can you tell me, in your opinion, how did we end 2015? I think pretty well. Uh, job growth was around one one and a half percent, which translates to about four to five th or two, uh, yeah, four to five thousand jobs, new jobs in the area, uh, and that's really the second year in a row that we've had that, and I think that's important. So, the job growth rate here is still below the national average. So I don't want to make it sound like this is you know a, a spectacular year, mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot better than we were seeing for really the previous fifteen years in this area. So mm -hmm. this area is doing much better than it used to, and I think that. Uh, really have to make that step before we could expect anything better. So I think that's a big plus. And the fact that it wasn't just a one-year blip in 2014 uh, was also important to this region. And so adding uh, that many jobs over two years, sort of uh, I think eight to 9,000 jobs over two years in, in an economy that has uh, about 380 uh, plus thousand jobs in the three-county area, uh, Montgomery, Miami, and Greene County, that's pretty good. So I think mm -hmm. uh, that, that bodes well. Uh, for the future, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But uh, but I think that's a nice trend uh, that's really reversed what was really a, a very rough uh, patch for the 2000s. Right. And even though we didn't have job declines in the early 2010s, they, it was really very flat. Uh, income growth also grew, uh, also occurred. We had income growth of one and a half to two percent. I mean, the final figures aren't aren't quite in yet. That's why I'm kind of using these approximations. But mm -hmm. But that's pretty decent too, um, and that's certainly a lot better than the early years of the recession. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of evidence um, of the impact of that and the positive impact of that in the region. I think we'll get a chance to talk about that uh, today. Uh, but I want to highlight uh, another important thing, which is uh, that the employment growth was really pretty broad based. There was really one, only one area that experienced a notable decline in employment, mm -hmm. and that was uh, federal employment. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mainly due to sequestration right. and the impact at the at the Air Force Base, uh, but manufacturing was up 1,600 jobs. I think most people saw that coming because Fu Fu Yao was right. was opening up, and a couple other manufacturers had announced uh, in late 2014 that they were going to be hiring more people in 2015. So that wasn't really sort of any sort of magical forecasting as much as just knowing that those hires are going to be happening. But retail was up 500 jobs. That's a that's sort of a an indicator that. Um, that incomes are higher and that employment is up uh, to have uh, retail growth. Uh, transportation and utilities were up 500. That, uh, that's also an area that, um, in which we've been looking for growth and, it, and it's been happening over the last couple of years. It's gradual, you know, it's, it's sort of steady but gradual. Mm -hmm. uh, but this region, not, not Dayton alone, but this region of the country um, is becoming an important uh, area in logistics for many corporations. And Dayton's certainly getting its share of that, that mm -hmm. job growth. Uh, financial services was up 500, and that actually surprised me a little bit, uh, but that was good news. Uh, you know, everything from banking to real estate to brokerage firms and so forth uh, did do some hiring for the first time, or net hiring uh, for the first time in a number of years. Uh, professional and technical services were up 400, that's uh, 400 jobs. That's an area uh, that essentially consists of business to business, high tech services, and professional services. Anything right. from legal services to technology services, those tend to be pretty good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that growth was, was a positive sign to me. Uh, healthcare is always a steady uh, growth factor. That grew by 1,800 jobs, which is actually a little more than I expected. So that was, that was really good news. But we usually see a thousand or so jobs added there every year. Okay. Um, leisure and hospitality was up mildly. Again, that's like retail. It's a sign that uh, people have more income and can spend on leisure and activities. Disposable income. Yeah. yeah. And then state and local government has finally ticked up. I think uh, following the recession, it took a few years before state and local governments felt uh, comfortable actually replenishing uh, some of the positions that they had they had foregone for a number of years. So services are 
creeping back up to, to previous levels. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of solidifies, I think anecdotally, what most people have noticed just watching the news, that there for a while it seemed like every job-related story you saw was negative, people were leaving town, and it it does seem that recently the news stories we have seen have been positive, that we've seen growth in the area. So it's mm -hmm. comforting to see that the numbers are backing that up. You mentioned in healthcare that the growth was a little higher than you expected. Was there anything else that surprised you you've seen from 2015? Um, yeah, I think the other one that I mentioned was uh, financial services. But the, mm -hmm. the, So I think I sort of brought the, the two sort of surprises, and they were pleasant surprises, so that was good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the slowdown in federal employment wasn't really a surprise because a, a sequestration was sort of a known uh, factor uh, before the year even started. Mm -hmm. um, one thing sort of related to federal employment uh, is actually sort of federally funded contract employment, especially for the Department of Defense. That seems to be growing. Mm -hmm. That's a much harder statistic to uh, to follow because it, it crosses many industries from business to business services to manufacturing and other types of, uh, of uh, specific activities. Or so uh, it certainly, at least from news stories, appears that there is a net growth in the number of contracts that are active in this area. Mm -hmm. And so that that's a positive, and I, I, I can't say that I was really expecting that, but I think that that's another uh, sort of pleasant surprise. You know, last year um, when we talked, we said the word steady growth, I think, quite a bit. Yeah. It was pretty much the theme of the whole show, and it has been for several years. It wasn't just the last time we met. You know, after the bottom kind of dropped out in 2008 with the recession, we've slowly made our way through trying to recover from that. Um, you, in the last year, our unemployment has dropped. You talked about all these negative, or positive, rather, positive signs that we're on our way, continuing. Do you think that's the trend for 2016 as well? We'll continue our way yeah, in a positive direction. That's correct. I think, again, the growth will be steady, but but moderate. I'm not mm -hmm. expecting a, a spectacular year, but I do think we'll have positive job growth, pro positive income growth, and it'll continue to be better than it had been from that 2000 to 2013 uh, stretch of time. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I sort of caution people when, they, when we see news events, um, and as we're taping, you know, there's a lot of stories about China right now, um, about how those kinds of events are offset by other events. And so, sure, there might be one negative event, and it might even be a sort of a significant negative event, but there's going to be other po positive events occurring throughout mm -hmm. the year. And that's why the net effect on a year-over-year -year basis tends to be more gradual. And uh, so I, I, I would sort of advise people not to get too worried or over, uh, by bad news or overly optimistic based on, based on sort of single good news events. Mm -hmm. um, it, there tends to be sort of these important underlying factors, which is that households are still gradually improving their financial uh, standing, uh, even this many years after the uh, financial crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's only sort of gr gradual improvement. And uh, job growth is gradual and income growth is gradual. And that's gonna, those are the most important factors really in determining sort of the path that the economy's on. And so increases in spending and increases in hiring going forward will, will probably be gradual. Mm -hmm. So um, that's essentially what, what's going on. And I, I'm more or less uh, confident that that's what'll continue. So. Yes, every year we sort of look at China and we look at Europe mm -hmm. <laughs> and some other events and sort of wonder, you know, is, is there going to be some sort of wholesale uh, calamity or some, some you know, major improvement? And um, they haven't been having major effects in the last few years, so mm -hmm. keep, keep note of that. And, and I'm not expecting major effects uh, going forward. I that's might be proven wrong, but, uh, <laughs> but that's sort of what I'm anticipating. It's comforting news. It's comforting news. Uh, and you also cautioned us, unemployment is down. Dayton has stayed right around Ohio's average. We're below the national average, which is good. Um, but last year you cautioned us that those numbers aren't always what they seem because there are other factors that go into the unemployment rate. Can you talk mm -hmm. about what those factors are and where we ended this year? What might be playing into that? Yeah, the main thing, well, so the Dayton unemployment rate, uh, the official unemployment rate is 4.5%, which is actually very good. Mm -hmm. That's a, that we would look at that as a sign of a healthy economy. And the U.S. unemployment rate is 5%, which is also very good. And as you mentioned, uh, the local unemployment rate is below the national rate. Um, but then, you know, the, the local rate tends to be less accurate. It has a bigger margin of error around it than the national rate. Uh, you know, it comes from 
the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Labor, in cooperation with the uh, Bureau of uh, Labor Market Information in the state of Ohio. Um, and they use a really small sample, to, uh, survey sample, to get monthly unemployment rates uh, because the main goal is to get a good state unemployment rate and a good national unemployment rate. If they had a bigger budget, they'd probably get a bigger sample for individual metropolitan areas. But the sample size is small enough in the local area that they're really forced to then sort of um, um, sort of uh, overlay their local survey against the state survey to try to come up with an estimate for, you know, back for the local region. Mm -hmm. And so you'll tend to see the Dayton unemployment rate, and you might have looked at the statistics, they really mirror the state unemployment rate right. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And so that's because they're putting a lot of weight on that state rate. And okay. so it's possible that our unemployment rate's a little bit better, or a little bit worse than the state rate, but it, and then that's not represented or reflected in the, in the uh, statistics. Um, the other thing, of course, is the unemployment rate, you know, really isn't always the best measure of the state of the economy because you can have, following a deep recession, a lot of what economists call discouraged workers, people who would like to work, but they've been out of work so long they've, they've even stopped looking, which sort of pushes them off they don't get the counted labor force. In that yeah, they don't get counted in the, in the labor force. And that, including them, would push up the unemployment rate somewhat. Okay. And, I th and most economists feel that the true unemployment rate, if you really counted those people, would be somewhat higher. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we want to keep that in mind, too. You look at that number, and there have been, uh, in, just in the last couple of weeks, there have been so many news stories here locally about the number of available jobs. Mm -hmm. Different industries looking for qualified workers. In fact, the Dayton Daily News on the 4th of January had a story that demand is high for qualified applicants in the trucking and nursing industries. They pointed those out specifically. And when you and I talked in preparing for this show, you mentioned the need for workforce development. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what effect that has on, you've got these open jobs and employers looking for qualified workers, but yet you have unemployed people. How do you make that connection? What right, it is, what we, we use the term matching. It's a matching problem. So when, we, when, you, when, um, when someone looks at, say, the unemployment rate, you, you have a tendency to make, maybe think of the job market as the signal market. Mm -hmm. But it really isn't. You know, the, the, there's a different market for dentists, uh, you know, and that market is different from electrical engineers, and that's different from truck drivers, and that's different from uh, wait staff at restaurants and so forth. And so there's all these multiple, many multiple job markets. And so what can happen is we can have really excessive numbers of people who are trained for one type of job relative to the demand for them, and that creates a surplus, which is unemployment. Mm -hmm. And there could be another market. Uh, that is understaffed, that has a shortage of people and, and would like to be able to hire more people. Mm -hmm. And the cross connections are very difficult. It's, it's very time consuming to train someone who used to work in a manufacturing facility to become a healthcare worker, right? They're gonna need right. specific education, training, uh, experience, certifications, you know, what, what, whatever. And so that's, that's a, uh, continuing problem with with labor markets. Labor markets suffer from that problem even when the economy is healthy, um, just because you know workers aren't really fungible or they can't be you know, immediately moved from one skill uh, occupation to another. Right. So there's been a tendency, I think, for um, government officials and economic development officials to sort of look uh, sort of broadly and say, well, we have maybe fewer college-educated people in this region, let's get more people with college degrees. But we need to be a little more narrowly focused on specifically what, what areas we need people to train in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's okay if maybe this region is producing too many you know, more electrical engineers than we need, uh, because they'll find jobs elsewhere. The, the national right. demand for, for right. electrical engineers is great. Uh, but what we want to do locally is to, to um, and we're already working on this, so there, or I shouldn't include me in the we, but, but there are <laughs> groups in the area who are trying to identify where these gaps exist. Right. And which industries and companies really are in need of more workers and mm -hmm. to have those workers ready and available about when they're needed, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to train people for a specific skill set five years before they're going to be needed. Right. You know, it's, so it's right. also a timing problem. So this isn't easy, but, but uh, you know, I'm trying to sort of explain that um, the more narrowly we can sort of identify the gaps in the job market, the better we'll be able to sort of narrowly fill them. Right. 
Um, and the job market is also notorious for not for not having pay adjust. So sometimes just offering higher pay right. will generate more workers to you know who become willing to come to this area or develop skills in an area. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned nursing. I mean, this this area has been experiencing a nursing problem most of the years, most of the 27 years that I've lived in this area. <laughs> it's amazing. And so, you know, some of that can be resolved by uh, adjustments in pay. And so labor markets are kind of notorious for not adjusting pay very quickly in both directions. It doesn't go down when it should and it doesn't go up necessarily right, when it should. Right. Very, very quickly. It eventually happens, but it doesn't happen very quickly. And some employers who have been used to paying at a certain level and maybe only giving one to two to three percent increases each year might have to seriously look at at least if their business is growing and they want it to grow mm -hmm. and their revenue stream is growing looking at their payroll and considering whether they can afford you know, they might not think they can afford but they can expand at least some firms uh, by by offering higher pay absolutely and you know when we talk about the, the matching the the skills of the workforce and the needs of the community and the business community um, I will say for our viewers' benefit that the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce um, received word at the end of 2015 that we have received a grant from the Lumina Foundation, which is um, a foundation that, that focuses on workforce needs. And we will be using that money to kind of approach it from a different angle. We've been working with um, educational institutions for, you know, since our, the beginning of our existence to make sure that the workforce is meeting the demands of, of the business community. But we're coming at it from a different angle in 2016 where we're talking to our members in the business community and saying, what are your needs? And then we are taking those needs and creating a pathway to that career, what education will you need, and and what does this um, what does this career mean to you, um, you know, pay wise and in skills needed, and take that to the education institutions mm -hmm. and telling them this is what the needs are to try to to you know open that pipeline even more, which is like you said we've been working on it for many years, but this is something that in 2016 the chamber will be using on just for. Okay, Your benefit. Great, yeah. <laughs> um, we and you talked about industries that we mentioned them last year: um, healthcare, transportation, warehousing, and, and wholesale distribution industry, and a little bit about manufacturing. That those were the industries to watch for 2015. And I got to say, you were spot on because here at the end of 2015, start of 2016, those are the industries we're still talking about: healthcare and the warehousing and distribution. Do you think those are the industries we will be watching in 2016 as well? Yeah, I think so. So healthcare, that's just been a steady growth industry uh, for decades in this, in this area. Part of it's uh, demographics, just the aging of the population. Mm -hmm. Part of it is a, a advances in healthcare technology and delivery. Um, and so there's so many more um, ways in which people can be treated, um, you know, providing you know, essentially new markets in, within healthcare. And of course, uh, you know, a company like uh, CareSource, which has been growing, you know, provider of services to uh, government agencies around the country for uh, Medicaid, uh, as well as other services they provide, they've they've been expanding as as oh, yeah. national demand for health care. Can't get away from CareSource right. this year; they've yeah. been everywhere. So, uh, I, I fully expect healthcare to to add jobs. There's construction going on, you know, for that industry right now, and mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would expect at least another. Th thousand jobs in, the, in that industry again this next year. Transportation, warehousing, and wholesale, yes, I think you know it's going to continue to grow. Again, logistics and supply chain management is a real growth field, and this is just geographically a good region, uh, a region that stands to benefit from growth of, of the use of those types of uh, management uh, uh, strategies, and so I think we'll continue to see growth there. Manufacturing, um, you know, there's, there's been some announced uh, hiring again, but this is the one industry that I think could be impacted by um, you know, the, the, the um, troubles that China is experiencing with their economy and the okay. flat growth in Europe. And those, uh, those nations are essentially um, you know, working to adjust their exchange rates to help them uh, recover, uh, essentially you know, uh, reducing their exchange rates, increasing the value of the dollar against their, their nation's currencies. And that will hurt uh, U.S. exports a little bit, and the main exporters in this area tend to be manufacturers. I'm not sure it'll have a huge effect on this region, but it'll be a dampening, uh, a dampening force. Uh, so I'd expect slower growth in manufacturing than we had recently. Um, and manufacturing always also has the um, 
the sort of long run trend right now of moving towards more use of equipment, capital, and right. less labor. Yeah. So um, this region has half the manufacturing employment than it, that it had 15 years ago, and that's not going to come back. And um, even though the region still produces probably 80, 85 percent of the manufactured goods that it did 15 years ago, mm. so it's just very that's much amazing. more dependent. Yeah, uh, you know, I saw someone from the Federal Reserve uh, Bank in Cleveland once mentioned that uh, you know, manufacturers kind of going the way of farming. You know, we produce as much food in this nation as we we ever did, uh, but do it with far far less labor. Right. And that's essentially the you know something we always have to keep in mind. Um, I don't know that we'll see the uh, financial services grow as much as it did this last year. I hope professional and technical services continue to grow. That's an industry that really sells a lot of services or provides a lot of services to outside of the area, which provides a nice flow of income mm -hmm. into the region. I've always been overly optimistic, <laughs> but I'm still <laughs> optimistic about that particular industry. So I hope I hope we can see some growth there. Yeah, well, and technology has become another a, a big industry in, in the Dayton region. We hear a lot of talk about the technology industry and um, the hopes and dreams of creating a, a little Silicon Valley here in the Dayton region, which is, Right, you're, you're smiling. That's what but, every community uh, hopes for. That's what everyone <laughs> hopes for. But we have seen growth in that industry, and that's an exciting thing. We actually have a pretty good skill set of computer scientists, engineers, and other related professionals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, trying to find ways to encourage entrepreneurship would be really useful, but it's hard mm -hmm. to find exactly what button to push to make that happen. Right, right. Um, and we have existing firms in that area that you know I hope could could expand or could you know identify new markets for themselves mm -hmm. if they're. Uh, if they've already sort of, sort of reached the potential in the markets they already serve. Right. When we talk about technology, I don't want to run out of time before we talk about the largest employer in the state, which is right here in our backyard, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Um, has a huge impact, billions of dollars in this region. Mm -hmm. um, the caveat with that is that it's tied to the federal government, the Department of F Defense, and the budget. Mm -hmm. Where do we stand right now with that, and what do you expect to see in right, Pat? You talked about some cutbacks in 2015. What do you think 2016 holds? Um, flat or maybe slight cutbacks, but really this, um, you know, politically, this is an election year, so I'm not expecting any major changes. Mm -hmm. These tend to be years in which you don't see major uh, program changes occur in the federal level, and so 2017 will be an important year to watch as we have a new president. Um, and so, depending on which president is elected, you know that'll have that could have an impact on Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Um, at any rate, um, for this coming year, I don't expect. Like I said, I don't really expect big change there. You know, we could see, but but you know something like another BRAC process, I don't think is in the offing until 2017 mm -hmm. or, or later. I don't even expect anything like that to be announced until 2017, if, if it were going to happen at all. Right. But the um, good thing about the way, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but the good mm -hmm. thing about our setup here, right, is that Wright Pat is a significant base in the Air Force. So when we see some of those cutbacks, in some cases, Wright Pat benefits because in other places where they're cutting back, they move those positions to Dayton. Is right. that That's accurate? That's true. Dayton was a net winner in the last BRAC process. Um, and you know, there's a lot of good things about what's going on at, at Wright Pat for for the local economy. So there's a lot of high paying, a lot of high paying jobs there. Mm -hmm. As you said, some of the you know, major activities of the Air Force occur at, at that base. So it's sort of a center of gravity for the Air Force in the sense that smaller bases uh, are much more likely to be shuttered and and have to move. Maybe act, some activities are still essential to the Air Force to a large base such as Wright Pat. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you know, intelligence, their, their graduate school, um, you know, all the medical research they're doing there now, uh, all the engineering they do there, uh, and so on, all the logistics and supply chain management work do that's done there, you know, it'd be really hard to see that ever um, harmed in any way or, you know, that it would change from being, being located in Dayton. Uh, so that is very beneficial to the region. So it is a huge... Uh, probably the biggest part of our uh, of our economic structure or mm -hmm. foundation in this area is that base. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the, all this funnels down to the consumer. Everything that we have talked about, it, it's being felt in the household budgets, the moms and dads, people who yeah. are actually out there, they're consumers and they're buying things. Um, I did look at our economic indicators, which the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce puts out in partnership with, uh, right, with uh, Wright State University every month, that sales tax collections from a year ago are up in, in every one of our reporting counties. And to me, who's a novice, that says that our household budgets are in a, a better place than they were a year ago. Is is that accurate? Yeah, that, that kind of brings us full circle to what we've been talking about. So the, the this is really a reflection of that job growth and not just the amount that we had last year, but the fact that we've had a couple of years now of pretty good job growth and, and reasonable income growth. And uh, so it is improving uh, household finances. And it is making households, uh, putting them in a better position to be able to spend that money. Make them feel, it's making them feel more secure mm -hmm. uh, about perhaps taking out a loan and purchasing a car. And we're seeing this nation nationwide. Uh, and, and fortunately, the Dayton region is certainly sharing in that. So I think, you know, you know, the, the um, you know, going beyond a year, you know, if we can, you know, build several years in a row of decent economic growth, it'll have you know, progressively uh, larger impacts on, positive impacts on the region. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a, a positive cycle, you know, yeah. rather, rather than some sort of negative cycle. Well, I can tell you, I hope that when we meet next year, Mm -hmm. this, at this same studio that we're using the words steady growth yet again, that it's a similar story. I thank you for sharing your information with us and being with us again this year. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. It's, it's it. risky business when you make <laughs> um, predictions and we come back to see how it turned out. Um, as I mentioned, the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce compiles economic data on a regular basis. They're called our economic indicators and uh, those are going to be placed, they are placed on our website every month, but the Economic Outlook, which is a more detailed publication, is put together once a year, and that will be out in late January, early February at DaytonChamber.org. You can get that information anytime at that website, and you can get exclusive economic information and job information by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thanks so much for being with us. Today's program is an annual tradition of our forecast of this New Year's economy. Our chamber assembles an expert panel each year to share thoughts about the new year. We appreciate their talent and thank Tom Trainer for representing the experts for 2016. Today's program has highlighted what most of us believe, that 2016 will be a growth year, though modest. We've seen continued rebound in our manufacturing sector, housing, and supply chain management industries. Healthcare will continue to grow, but more of the growth for our region will be in the government care programs and home health care. Housing affordability for our region is outstanding, and we think the housing market should still be able to take advantage of that, and with some pent-up demand, will trend better than in previous years. Certainly two of the variables of our economy in 2016 will be the stock market and long and short-term interest rates. We know we will see changes, but it's not always clear as to the volatility of the markets. Those changes always affect business decisions and consumer confidence. However, one of our greatest challenges remains our workforce. We have too many jobs going unfilled because we haven't grown our talent fast enough. If we are to retain business and for that fact, current talent, we must continue our push for a trained and talented workforce that will drive our economic growth going forward. We hope that you've enjoyed our program and wish you a prosperous 2016.